you may have ever heard of this. Screw tape letters, I'll kind of give you a, a rundown of it. I'm going to read you a passage to it, or a passage from it tonight. Uh, the screw tape letters is, it's, it's written from a, a completely different perspective than, uh, than most books are written from. Because what the screw tape letters are about, uh, it is letters between two demonic forces that are in charge of an individual. Okay, and throughout the screw tape letters, we never get the name of the individual. But uh, screw tape is the elder demonic force. Okay, so he is the most experienced demonic force where the, uh, the understudy to him goes by the name of Wormwood. And so Wormwood is attached to an individual, attached to a, uh, a patient is what they call it in, in, in those screw tape letters. And so they're, they're writing letters back and forth and talking about what's going on in this patient's life. So you and I would be a patient, okay? And so, uh, again, Wormwood is initially in charge of said patient, and then screw tape is the more experienced, retired demonic force. And so, um, Wormwood tells screw tape that his patient has become a Christian. And this is a, a section from the letter that the more experienced demon sends to the one who is in charge of the patient. It says, one of our greatest allies at the present time is the church itself. Now, mind you, this is the demonic force speaking, okay? Whenever he talks about the enemy, he's talking about God because this is a demonic force. It says, one of our greatest allies at the present time is the church itself. Do not misunderstand me. I do not mean the church as we see her spread out through all time and space and rooted in eternity, terrible as an army with banners that I confess is a spectacle which makes our boldest tempers uneasy. But fortunately, it is quite invisible to these humans. All your patient sees is the half-finished sham Gothic erection on the new building estate. When he goes inside, he sees the local grocer with rather an oily expression on his face bustling up to offer him one shiny little book containing, a, containing corrupt text of a number of religious lyrics, mostly bad, and in very small print. When he gets to his pew and he looks around him, he sees just that selection of the neighbors whom he has hitherto avoided. You will want to lean pretty heavily on those neighbors. So that was the direction of the more experienced demon to the one who is in charge of this patient. And he's telling him, as, as you heard, that the church itself is one of the greatest allies to the demonic forces. Because when... Because we don't see the church as the church really is. But yet whenever we come in, a lot of us will say that we don't see the church as this grounded, um, as this grounded powerful force but, you force, but yet we see it as individuals with flaws. And so then we think that because those who make up the church are flawed, then therefore the church itself is flawed. And that is a flawed reasoning because that is not the case. Because the church, as God intended it, the church as God put forward is going to come out victorious no matter what. And so I'm going to talk to you tonight out of uh, my, probably easily one of my top three favorite passages of Scripture. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to the book of Judges. And so again, I wonder if we attach things to Christ that he never intended to put his name on. We're going to focus tonight on being a witness. We're going to focus tonight on um, making convenient Christianity. We're going to talk about Gideon who goes through a major victory but yet finds himself without a legacy. How many of you want to be remembered? We all want to be remembered, right? We want to be remembered. We want to have some kind of legacy. We want people to show up to our funeral. We want people to say our name after we have passed. We want to have a legacy. But what are you creating that legacy in? What are you going to be remembered for? Is it going to be your political opinion? Is it going to be your dress style? What, what kind of legacy are you creating? Is it going to be that, you know... Maybe they'll say, you know, that, that Christy Smith, man, she always spoke her mind. Is that going to be your legacy? Is it going to be, um, you know, that, that Sam, he was, a, he was a good guy. What's going to be the legacy? What type of legacy do 
do you want to leave? And and I I I kind of chuckled as again as I heard you guys talking before service, and I was just kind of listening that I'm not trying to um, to burst anybody's bubble, okay? But what I want to tell you is that maybe we shouldn't feel as accomplished because see, whenever you whenever you reach that point whenever we get so overwhelmed by all the success then we forget about actually the boots on the ground type stuff we forget about our lifestyle we forget about the choices that we're making we forget about the effect that we're having on others we're forgetting about the legacy that we're actually going to leave so what kind of legacy are we going to leave tonight so in the book of Judges, let me just run this down for you. We're going we're gonna to focus on chapter 8, or a group of scripture out of chapter 8, but I'm going to read you some before and kind of in the middle. Uh, but in the book of Judges, specifically, we have uh, one thing to know is that they are in the promised land. Okay? So the, uh, uh, the, the children of Israel are in the promised land, and they are at this time in their relationship with God where it's kind of like a roller coaster. So the children of Israel will do evil on the side of the Lord, and then God will raise up a judge, and the children of Israel will cry out to the Lord, and the Lord saves them. And then a couple of scriptures down, you will see where it says the children of Israel did evil on the side of the Lord. God will raise up a judge, the children of Israel cry out, the Lord will save them. And then a couple of scriptures down, you see again the children of Israel did evil on the side of the Lord. So they are in the promised land. They're in the land that was given to them. They're in the land that was promised to them. But yet they are still fighting an enemy. But yet God told them to wipe out those enemies before they entered the promised land. But they still find themselves fighting an enemy when they are in the very land that God set aside for them. In the very land that God made them victorious over. And so... We're going to focus on, on Gideon tonight. Gideon is one of the judges that God has raised up. The children of Israel are doing evil on the side of the Lord. God is raising up a judge, and that judge is Gideon. So uh, look at Judges chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And this tells you very specifically of what kind of enemy or what kind of battle the children of Israel are facing. Judges chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. It says, And the children of Israel did evil on the side of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens, which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. Did you catch that? They're in their own promised land given to them by God, but yet they find themselves making dens and hiding in caves. But they're in the land given to them by God. And verse 3 says, And so it was, when Israel has sown, that the Midianites came up, and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. So let me tell you, let's just point, let me bring out a few things right here in this particular group of scripture. Number one, the enemy that they are facing is called the Midianites, okay? If you go back to the Greek translation of Midianites, it actually means strife. That's what their, their name means. So basically they are being held captive by strife. But here's what this enemy is doing. It's doing something completely different than normal. It's not just coming in and wiping them out. It's allowing them to plant. You see, it's allowing them not only to plant, but it's allowing them to nurture. It's allowing them to grow. But the moment it's time for a harvest, the enemy is coming in and taking that harvest. So they're being allowed to plant they're being allowed to grow and to nurture. But the moment there is a result that comes out of it, the enemy is coming in and taking away that result. I would think that that is probably more aggravating than not being able to plant or grow or nurture anything. But imagine putting your blood, sweat, and tears into something. And the moment that the benefit is about to come the enemy comes in and removes it and you have nothing 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 left imagine that frustration and that aggravation and so what we find is god is about to call gideon to save the people from the midianites god is about to raise gideon up to bring the people to repentance and to 
to save them from the Midianites and to wipe out the Midianites. But whenever he calls them, and this is a familiar passage in Gideon that we think of, um, probably one of the most familiar scriptures out of the book of, Ge- the book of Gideon. Lord have mercy. Out of the passage of Judges uh, regarding Gideon. And so what we have Gideon doing is Gideon is thrashing wheat in the wine press. Gideon is a coward. Gideon is a child of God. He is an Israelite. And he is hiding from an enemy in a land that God had given him. Do you see the silliness there? He is hiding from an enemy in the land that God has given him. And so he is a coward. Why is he a coward? Because he is thrashing wheat in the wine press. The wine press was made to do what? It was made to press the grapes in order to make wine. When was wine used? Wine was used for celebration. So he has and then turned a place of celebration into a place of survival. Have we done that to our churches? Have we done that to our sanctuaries? Where whenever we come in here, it's supposed to be a place of celebration. But yet we can't celebrate because we're dealing with all the mistakes we made during the week. We're dealing with all the issues we made during the week that we should have been working on in our prayer closet at home. And so this sanctuary, which has been a place of celebration, is turned into a place of survival. And we wonder why we can't hear the word that that Brother Todd delivers. We wonder why we can't get involved in praise and worship. It's because we can't go to the celebration stage because we're still trying to survive. And see, if you pull out Judges chapter 6, verse 12, this is a scripture that we get that is, is quoted often whenever talking about Gideon. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. You courageous man of God, the Lord is with you. But yet everything that Gideon was doing said that he was not courageous. Everything that Gideon was doing was saying that Gideon was a coward. Again, he had turned a place of celebration into a place of survival. But yet when the angel of the Lord speaks to him, the angel of the Lord says, You mighty man of valor. What's significant about that? The angel of the Lord didn't say, Listen here, you coward, what are you doing? Because if he would have called him where he currently was, that would have been the name. But the angel of the Lord did not call him where he currently stood. The angel of the Lord called him to where he was going to stand. So let's summarize the next two chapters for you. So we're looking at, again, Judges 6 through Judges 8. And we're going to land on Judges 8. So let me just kind of tell you what Gideon has been doing. So Gideon is called by the angel of the Lord. Uh, Gideon becomes a man who is all about getting confirmation from God. He is a man who is constantly uh, wanting to know if he's on the right path. He is a man who is humble. He is a man who, uh, um, uh, who never wants to step outside of his bounds. Okay, He is a man who always wants to know that he is stepping where God has intended him to step. And so one way that he does that, again, very familiar part of Gideon's story, is he lays a fleece before God to confirm that everything that he's hearing is correct. God confirms that not once but twice. Then God tells him to to go out and to tell the children of Israel they are about to defeat the Midianites and for all of those who want to fight that battle to come to him. 22,000 men come to, to fight with him, but they are fighting against an enemy that Scripture says is like locusts. They're fighting against the enemy that says that their camels and their weapons could not be numbered. So even 22,000 men was very small in comparison to the enemy that they were fighting. So 22,000 men come to fight with Gideon. But God says, Gideon, it's too many. I bet Gideon thought, what? Are you serious? I'm a fraction of the enemy. And you're telling me that 22,000 men are too, too many? And so God says this. God says, I want you to ask a simple question. I want you to go to your 22,000 men. I want you to ask them, are you afraid? And if they are afraid, send them home. Don't mess with them. Don't try to calm their fears. But if they are afraid, send them home. 
Because God understood that out of 22,000 men, the portion of them that were afraid, that fear would rub off on those who were ready to fight. And God didn't need, nor did he want, the, the warriors who were going to be easily influenced and turn their back and run whenever things got tough. So out of 22,000 men, whenever he asked that question, 10,000 of them returned. And God looked at Gideon and said, it's not enough. It's still too many. I couldn't even imagine what Gideon was thinking. I couldn't even, I bet he was like, I don't know what you're doing, but this is not going to work. I wonder if he felt maybe a little discouraged. I wonder if he even felt maybe a little defeated. Because God, I can't win this battle. It was questionable with 22,000 men. Now you've got me down to 10,000 men and you're telling me that's not enough. I can't win that battle with that many men. I don't have the resources to do that. And God says, it's not enough. And he says, this is how I want you to determine who is worthy to move forward and who, is wor who has to stay back is by the technique they use to drink water from a stream. And he says, if they, <clears throat> if they put their head down and they lap water like a dog, they are not worthy for this battle. But yet, if they bring water to their mouth and use their hand as a cup, those are the men that you want to keep. Why do you think that is? It's exactly right. He needed men who not only weren't afraid, but men who were constantly looking at the enemy's attack or for the enemy's attack, who was constantly looking around them, who was aware of their surroundings. Even when they were being victorious, they still had to be aware of where the enemy was located. And so after this takes place, Gideon has 300. 300 men. He went from 22,000 to 300 men. And then here's the funniest part of Gideon's story. Gideon is talking to his men. And he says, okay, we're about ready to go fight this battle. And throughout this whole process, Gideon is still seeking confirmation from God. Not wanting to overstep his bounds. Not wanting to step out of God's authority or God's direction at any time. Okay, that was who he was. That was his characteristic. And so he looks at these 300 men and he says, we are going to, uh, we're going to surround the camp and here are the weapons you're going to take. It was a trumpet, a pitcher, and a light that they were to put into the pitcher. God calls you to fight the biggest battle of your life. Physical battle with 300 men and he arms you with a trumpet, a pitcher and a lamp that would be like God saying okay you are now going to go fight the greatest army physical army that we know and you're going to do that with a washcloth, a soda can and a spatula What am I going to do with those things? Those aren't even declared as weapons. That, that doesn't even make any sense. And so what the army does, they surround the camp. And when on Gideon's word, they break their pitchers. The light shines. They blow the trumpet. And when they do that, the Midianites are so confused that they turn on each other. And Gideon and his men never had to lift the finger. Never had to lift a finger because the men of the children of Israel, or the, I'm sorry, the Midianites were so confused by what was just taking place. You see, they could have chose to walk away because it just seemed silly. They could have chose to, to argue with Gideon and say, you've lost your mind because it seems silly. But yet the children of Israel are overjoyed they are relieved and they are victorious. And they are celebrating at this moment, after this victory. The enemy that has beat them down, the enemy that has kept them from, from surviving, the enemy that had kept them from producing, has now been taken care of. I can tell you one random point. If they would have listened to God before they entered the promised land, they would never have been fighting this enemy in the promised land. And we pick up Gideon's story in Judges chapter 8. 
verses 22 through 26. If you have your, have, if you have your Bibles, I don't know what's wrong with me tonight. Open those for me. Judges chapter 8, <clears throat> verses 22 through 26. This is after they have defeated the Midianites. And they are celebrating their victory. They are celebrating. They are feeling accomplished. They are feeling relieved. And they are feeling overjoyed. They are victorious. And this is what takes place. Judges chapter 8 verses 22 through 26. Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also. For thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said unto him, I will not, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you, the Lord shall rule over you. And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you, that you would give me every man the earrings of his prey, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, We will willingly give them. And they spread a garment and did cast therein every man the earrings of his prey. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand and seven hundred shekels of gold beside ornaments and collars and purple raiment that was on the kings of Midian and beside the chains that were about the camel's neck. So two things happen here. First thing is that the children of Israel are asking Gideon to rule over them, right? They're, they're excited. Again, they're victorious, and so they are asking Gideon to rule over them. But Gideon's response is a legitimate response. Gideon's response says, no, I'm not going to rule over you. The angel of the Lord is going, or the Lord is going to rule over you. What did he do wrong there? What did he do wrong? If you look at verse 22 and 23... What did he do wrong? Did he do anything wrong? They ask him to rule over the children of Israel, and his response is, No, for the Lord will rule over you. But you notice, he never corrected them whenever they said, You, Gideon, delivered us. You, Gideon, saved us from the hand of the Midian. Gideon never corrected them. He never said, no, 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 it wasn't I who saved you, but it was God Jehovah who saved you. He never once corrected them. You see, at this point in Gideon's story, Gideon was no longer a man who was constantly asking for God's direction because he had seen victory upon victory. So he became so satisfied with where he currently sat that he actually began to elevate himself over the position of God himself. Because of the victories that he had seen. And so he becomes very lax. Not only does Gideon not correct them whenever they say, they give Gideon all of the credit for the victory. He then tells them, I'm not going to be your king. But yet he picks up a garment that a king would wear. So his mouth is saying, I'm not going to rule over you. But yet he is giving the impression that he is king. And you find that in verse 26, whenever it says, And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand and seven hundred shekels of gold, beside ornaments and collars and purple raiment that was on the kings of Midian. So he was saying, I don't want to be your king, but yet I'm going to put on a garment that declares me as king. And so it raises the question, Are we submitted to God's authority? Are we saying to people and are we saying to those around us, no, I don't want to be elevated. I don't want to be, I don't want to be thanked. I don't want to be uh, slapped on the back. You know, it's not about me. But yet are we putting on the garments that makes everything about us? Are we saying, I don't want to be king of my own life, but yet we are wearing the garment that makes us king of our own life? Or are we submitting to God's authority? Are we honoring God's God line? Are we crediting Him with our successes? Or do we look at God like a spoiled child and say, but this way is a lot easier. This way is more convenient. All the while, God responds, your ease does not trump my rules. You see, this is a stark reality that's going to, to, to hit us here tonight. The tension that sometimes exists between our convenience and God's regulations. What are we going to choose? 
Do we choose convenience? Or do we choose God's regulations? This is a choice that Gideon made. Gideon chapter 8, verse 27. And Gideon made an ephod of it and put it in the city of Ophrah. And all Israel whored after it there. And it became a snare to Gideon and to his family. Gideon had just been victorious over the Midianites. Through God's direction, through God's planning, through God orchestrating that, he had just been victorious. Yet he never gives, gives God glory for that. And now he finds himself connecting something to God that God never intended to be connected to. He's connecting something to God. He's connecting something as holy, as righteous, that God never declared as holy or righteous, but yet because of Gideon's disobedience, it was declared the exact opposite. Opposite Because of the way Gideon went about doing it, something that could have been holy, that could have been righteous, now become an idol to the children of Israel, to the very people that Gideon was called to lead. You see, Gideon was fueled by the lure of convenience. Gideon sacrificed commitment to God's order. And his error would have horrific, long-lasting repercussions for him, for his family, and for the people that he was called to speak to, for the people he was called to minister to, for the people he was called to lead to greater things. Gideon actually became a stumbling block. He actually became a stumbling block. And you may be thinking, Amanda, how did you get all that? Where does that come from? Let's talk about the ephod for a moment. Because that's what verse 27 tells us, right? And Gideon made an ephod and put it in his, in his city in Ophrah. And all of Israel whored after it there and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. Number one is what is an ephod? What does it represent? What is its significance? And number two, why did he put it in his city and why was that wrong? Okay, so that's what we're going to answer now. So the high priest wear an ephod. Okay, it's a mysterious garment. Uh, to be honest, we don't even know, even to this day, as far as the theology goes, we don't really know a whole lot about it. Uh, it looks like an apron of sorts, and it possesses uh, many prominent features that are contained with beautiful stones and symbolism on the ephod. So it has 12 precious stones that cover the breastplate in four rows of three, and of course that represents the 12 tribes of Israel. And so most notable on the, the breastplate are these two stones that are flat stones and they are secured within the front of the vest and it is Urim and Thummim. Okay? <clears throat> when exposed, when those two stones, they were significant above all the others, whenever they were exposed, they would somehow relay God's guidance or His approval or disapproval on a process that the priest was doing or possibly thinking about doing. So in theory, this is how we believe that this works. A light would flash from one stone to the other to indicate affirmation, and then it would uh, go to the other stone to indicate a negative response. Okay, so depending on the stone that was to light up, that would be the way to know, okay, if this one lit up, then it's a yes. If this one lit up, it was a no. But not only is it the garment, the term ephod sometimes refers, especially in pagan environments, to any image or idol over which the ephod was draped. Okay? So they could make some kind of idol and they could drape the ephod over that, and at that point, everything becomes the ephod. Does that make sense? So not only is the garment the ephod, but now the idol that was created is the ephod. What did Gideon request from the men? He requested gold, and he requested precious stones. Gideon created his own ephod. The garment that he made was draped over the gold that he collected from the enemy God allowed him to defeat. 
Gideon overstepped his bounds in a major, major way. You see, we're not given details of the image, but no matter what it was, the purpose of the ephod was still the same. It was to hear directly from God. And Gideon places the gold and the garment in Ophrah, his city. But yet Shiloh had been authorized by God as the religious center for the people. Gideon chooses convenience because Shiloh was 35 miles away from Ophrah. Meaning that he would have to travel 35 miles to see the ephod, to talk to the priest. And that leads us to another thought. Gideon was never allowed to wear the ephod in the beginning. It wasn't it wasn't his order to wear the ephod or even to, to use the ephod. That was held back for a priest. Gideon was not a priest. If you look at Exodus chapter 28, verse 4, it talks about the ephod. And it says, These are the garments that they shall make, a breastpiece, an ephod, a robe, a coat of checker work, a turban, and a sash. They shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons to serve me as priests. You see, Gideon was not in that lineage. Gideon was overstepping the bounds. He was overstepping the guidelines that God had in place because it was inconvenient. A 35-mile trip would have required at least two days of travel by foot. And having no priestly position, Gideon wouldn't even be allowed to enter the holy place once he got there. He would have to wait for a priest. You see, after his personal encounters with God in the wine press and with the fleece and all the other divine demonstrations of success against the Midianites, Gideon felt accomplished. Gideon felt victorious. And he felt like he was the exception to the rules. He was Gideon for crying out loud. Surely, God didn't mean that he couldn't wear the ephod he was Gideon. I mean, look at everything that God had done for him. Look at everything that God did through him and for him. He was Gideon. Surely, divine order didn't apply to him. He was called out by the angel of the Lord specifically and was told that he was a mighty man of valor. Surely, the order of God didn't matter to him or apply to him. You see, he thought, he thought he could relate to God on his own terms. He thought he could make up new rules and expect God to yield to them. Gideon had become addicted to hearing God so much that he prioritized hearing God over God himself. So he created his own ephod. Easier to get to, more convenient to commune with, and closer to home. I think it's pretty easy to point a finger at Gideon. I think it's pretty easy to, to say everything that he's doing wrong and to, to, to talk about Gideon and to, to tear Gideon down for his decisions. But I wonder if we considered our own relationship with God in the light of Gideon's response. I mean, how do we respond? How do we respond when God's plan requires more effort or energy than maybe you hope to expend? Or possibly more time. How do we respond? How do you respond when receiving God's guidance requires long patience? How do you respond when receiving God's guidance actually feels like that you're not hearing or you're not that God's not hearing you at all? That you have asked and asked and you feel as if you've done everything that God has told you, everything that God has commanded. Yet, for some reason, God isn't answering. How do you respond when honoring God with your wealth becomes sacrificial? How do you respond whenever, rather than just paying your 10%, God asks you to pay your 10%, including the, or on top of the house payment that is due? How do you respond when, when paying your tithes and your wealth or, or giving God your wealth becomes sacrificial? 
How do you respond when reading and understanding the Bible requires more time than simply scanning a supplemental resource? How do you respond when gathering with the local church means forging through a rainstorm or a snowstorm that's hopefully coming soon or cold weather that you would rather avoid? How do you respond when living in accordance with His moral standard means sticking out like a sore thumb? I'm listening to a podcast right now I know that probably makes me a dork, I'm not for sure. Brother Todd, you would like this. You need to download it. It's called Revisionist History. And it's by a a guy, uh, I'm trying to think of his name. It's something Maxwell. No, Malcolm Gladwell. There you go. Revisionist History is the podcast. He did about 10 episodes. And what he does, he takes something that has happened in our history and he looks at it from a different perspective. So it may be something that, to be honest, we, we possibly might know about everything that he's talked about so far. Um, I had an idea. I could recognize names, but I really couldn't tell you the situation. And so, for example, he talks about uh, Saigon, which was during the Vietnam War. And he talks about the RAND group and things like that. And he looks at that from a different perspective. Well, this last one that I had, um, that I had listened to is about, it's called The Big Man Can't Shoot. Any idea who he's talking about there? The big man can't shoot. Mm -hmm. Wilt Chamberlain. Wilt Chamberlain can be considered one of the greatest basketball players that ever existed. He broke scoring records. But he was the worst free throw shooter that basketball had ever seen. He was 7'1", I believe. And not only was he 7'1", was he extremely tall and, and pretty stout, but he was graceful. He would walk on the court and it would actually look like that his feet weren't even touching the ground. He was just gliding across the court. He couldn't even be defended. The only way that opposite teams would defend him was to foul him. Because they knew that if they could foul him, he would miss the free throw and they would get the basketball. And so there was another gentleman about that time who played with Chamberlain and he had perfected the technique of the granny shot this is a man not Wilt Chamberlain but the the individual his last name is Barry the individual that played with him would miss nine to ten free throws a season LeBron James misses roughly a hundred to a hundred and fifty a season just to kind of give you a a connection there. And so he had worked with Wilt Chamberlain. And so for one season, Wilt Chamberlain shoots the granny shot. He has his highest scoring game during that season. He has his highest scoring season. And his free throw percentage was roughly about 70 to 80% for that season. The next season rolls around. And Wilt Chamberlain is no longer shooting the granny shot. Any thoughts on why? He was embarrassed. Embarrassed. He went from a man who could be counted on when the game was on the line, because if you know basketball, you know that most basketball games, close basketball games, are won where? At the free throw line. So he went from a man who could be counted on during the crucial moments of the game to a man who they had to bench because they knew that if he got fouled, he could not make the shot. Even though he had the ability to make those shots with accuracy, he chose not to do it because it made him look silly. I think we can relate to that. I was with a friend of mine last night and she, we were picking some things up. Uh, She was getting ready to go grocery, or she was getting ready to go deer hunting with her, her dad and her husband. 
and we were just getting some different things. I was shopping, she was shopping. And we go to, to I go to get Dasani water. You know, I'll put a plug in for Dasani water there. I go to get a bottle of water or a case of water. And she says, I need to stop over here and I need to get a pack of beer. Not with me, you don't. How many of you would say that you don't care what anybody thinks about you? If you don't, you should. To an extent. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. I represent Jesus Christ. People know that. I'm very vocal about that. Very vocal about that. It doesn't matter if it was mine. I'm not going to be seen with it. Because the moment that I'm seen with it, and somebody sees me or somebody sees me out or somebody believes that that is mine whenever there's a possibility that whenever I go to witness to that person the words that I choose to speak are never going to be heard because of what they seen two weeks ago now am I telling you that that's not if you I'm not saying that you have to live your life in a way that that people not everybody's going to like you okay I'm not saying that But I just wonder and I, I love you, know that. I just wonder if a Democrat would hear you speak to them about God. I just wonder if a Hillary supporter would hear your words about compassion based on what you've been saying since the primary. That's my heart tonight. Is there something I said that if I would go minister to somebody, they would say, I can't go to your church because I'm not Republican. Are we attaching God's name to things that He never intended His name to be attached to? Now, I already know what you're thinking. I know that you're thinking, well, Amanda, I voted this way because of, the, of, of pro-life. I voted this way because of relationship with Israel. I voted this way because of this. I voted this way because of that. All the things that God cares about. But I know some good Democrats out there that are registered to vote as Democrats, but yet voted pro-life. Is there something that will they hear us when we talk about compassion? Will they hear us whenever we talk about love? Could I minister to the individual who had an abortion? Or they look at my Facebook or my Twitter or my Instagram or whatever and feel despised. How many of you ever read the book The Shack? They're coming out with a movie, by the way. It kind of falls in line with something like C.S. Lewis will write. It talks about Christian principles, but from a, a metaphorical stance. And the, the character that represents God in this book um, is a large black woman. And a lot of people... They don't like the book because of that. Because, not because of that, but because it's, you know, it's, it's metaphorical. It's just like the Chronicles of Narnia where people said that was witchcraft when that whole series is grounded on Scripture. And within that book, there's a statement that the character that represents Jesus says, he says, I'm not trying to make them Democrat. I'm not trying to make them Republican. I'm not trying to make them Pentecostal or Baptist. I'm trying to make them Christian. Have we connected things to Christianity that just aren't true? What's your legacy tonight? Because you see, Gideon had good intentions. He had really good intentions. He was going to bring the presence of God to his people. And we could spend a lot of time talking about the negative aspects of Gideon's actions. He had, he had a good heart. 
he had a good heart. And, you know, and so there, there wasn't really strong leadership in this error in the book of Judges. There wasn't strong leadership there. I mean, the, the high priest was apparently not functioning actively among the people. So Gideon desired to step in and to fill that leadership role. He desired to step in and to offer the people a place to turn to for spiritual governance. It's understandable, right? I mean, it's even considered noble. And Shiloh was so off the beaten path for his people that they wouldn't be able to get there every single day. And so he was doing something good by bringing the ephod and by bringing the, the, uh, by bringing the presence of God near him. But you see, he didn't bring the presence of God to them because the presence of God was intended to be in Shiloh. He, he overstepped his bounds in a way that whenever the people would go and call upon the name of God, they were out of order whenever they would do that. And Gideon was responsible for that. He was responsible for, for calling them out of order. For 40 years, 40 years, the ephod, the ephod was illegitimately placed in Ophrah. For that 40 years, Israel lived relatively in peace. With the deceiving blanket of solace that crossed the land disguised the adultery that was spreading through their culture. For decades, it was ripping them apart spiritually, fiber by fiber by fiber. Because they had made Christianity convenient. They had attached things to God's presence that God never intended to be attached to. Gideon dies. And the man who saved them from the hand of the Midianites, the man called by God, the man who the children of Israel said, we want you to rule over us. He has passed on and this is what happens immediately to the children of Israel. Judges chapter 8, verses 34 through 35. Actually, we're going to start at 33, I'm sorry. Verses 33 through 35. And soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel turned again and whored after the Baals and made Baal bear their God. The same God that Gideon tore down at the the front end of his ministry, the same God that he tore down from his father's house, the moment he dies, that scripture says, as soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel turned again and whored after the Baals and made Baal bareth their God. And then it goes on further in verse 34. And the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God who had delivered them from the hand of their enemies on every side, and they did not show steadfast love to the family of Jerubbabel, that is Gideon in return for all the good that he had done to Israel. The moment he dies, they forget about God and they forget about Gideon. They don't even show his family respect, but yet this is the same family that the children of Israel was saying, we want you to rule over us and your sons to rule over us and their sons to rule over us. But yet at the end of Gideon's life, there is no legacy. There's no legacy. There's not a person in this room who would say, Amanda, I'm okay if my children stop serving God when I'm gone. There's not a person in this room that would say that because you want to leave behind a spiritual legacy, not just for your children, but your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and generations and generations to come. You cannot do that with convenient Christianity. You cannot do that by making Christianity easy for your children or even for your household. You cannot do that by making your sons and your daughters think that if nobody else shows up, then I don't have to show up. You will not leave a spiritual legacy that way. You will not leave a spiritual legacy whenever you are telling your children it is okay to do this and that if it makes you happy. You will not leave a spiritual legacy that way. You will not leave a spiritual legacy where God's name is remembered in your family, where your name is remembered in your family whenever you just have good intentions. 
Because Gideon had good intentions. And they were not enough. They were not enough to, un- to honor God. They were not enough to sustain spiritual growth. They were not enough to keep a spiritual legacy intact for generations to come. You see, you and I cannot walk away just intending to walk in accordance with truth. We have to start walking in truth. God's truth, not society's truth, not our culture's truth. But we have to start walking in truth. It's not just about good intentions. But it's about obedient actions about obedient actions tonight. If you want to leave something behind for your children spiritually, you have to be obedient to His Word even when it's not convenient. You have to be obedient to His Word even when He's telling you to keep your mouth closed. You have to be obedient to His Word whenever He's telling you to do something that makes you look foolish. We can say all day, God, I meant to do that. I meant to do that. And that's not enough. I believe one of the biggest lies that we accept in the Christian faith is God knows my heart. God knows that I meant to read Scripture today. God knows that I had every intent to spend time with Him in prayer. God knows that I really wanted to go minister to that man or that woman that's homebound. God knows that I didn't really mean to be a jerk to my family. God knows that I didn't really mean to say those words that didn't edify him, but yet edified my flesh. God knows that whenever I told that lie, it wasn't really a big one. I mean, God knows my heart. He does know your heart. But he requires obedience. He requires obedience tonight. Be careful, church. And this is where, man, this is where my heart is. Be careful on the things that you're connecting Christianity to. You can be victorious. You can be joyful. You can be relieved in all of those things. Understand that the words that you're saying, the words that you're typing... The words that you're yelling, and maybe the very words that the individual you're called to speak to says, I'm not listening to them. By no means am I telling you not to stand up for God and His Word. But we don't have to yell it so loud. Bow your heads with me. Father, I love you. Father, I honor you and I thank you. And Lord, I know that there are times, Father, that that I have connected your name to things, Lord, that I have ostracized individuals in my life, Father, because of an opinion or an idea that I have. And Lord, for that, I'm sorry. Because you see, it's not about being right, it's not about being wrong, Father, but it's about ministering your word. It's about showing people love and compassion, Father, in the, the bounds of your truth. You see, we can speak truth without beating them down. We can speak your word without making them feel separated from us or unloved from us. Because you see, whenever they feel separated or unloved for us, it just makes me wonder if it's your word. Lord, I know that that people choose to to listen or not to listen. Father, I know that they choose, they have free will, Father, and they make choices every single day. Lord, I pray that rather than telling people what not to be or what not to do, Father, that we become like you, more like you, more like you. I love you, Jesus. I honor you with everything, Father. And I praise your name, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Any questions or comments tonight?